But I agree. I mean, the, the teaching uh, practice over here, that's why there are so many young teachers now that have got into it, taught for a few years and are now going private or leaving teaching completely because of the conditions that they're being taught in. Um, it is, it's bad. It's really bad. It's, it's really honestly very, very bad here. And I don't know about the rest of the states, but I know in New York, mm -hmm. teachers are underappreciated, yeah. overworked, yeah. expected to do way too much yeah. in a in a time frame. And it's just, yeah, I have a lot of friends who literally are much older than me. I'm in my later 20s yeah. and they're like, I'm already done, ready to be done teaching. Yeah. yeah. Just too much stress. Well, that's it. And the crazy thing is, you know, years and years and years ago, even not that long ago, probably back in the 1950s, um, certainly in the United States, it was a case of you went to school and school finished at three o'clock, the teacher cleaned the boards, and then they went home. You know, they prepared for the lessons the next day, but they didn't work till 11, 12 o'clock at night, marking stuff and writing uh, Ofsted reports and all these other things. You know, it's like, guys, you know, it's amazing. We've taken something that worked and complicated it. And then yeah. really screwed it up, you know. Yes, That's, that is that is literally exactly how I feel yeah. about the education system. That boils it down into one sentence. Yes, but, exactly. there's lots of things that people do that about. You know, I, again, you know, I was I was on a good, uh, coaching session the other day with someone that said my sales are really struggling, and I said <laughs> similar to what I do with you, and I said to her, I was like. Well, you know, how many hours do you spend a, a week selling? He said, oh, uh, and then he started talking, well, well, I spend, you know, 15 hours a week marketing. I spend 15 hours a week doing this and website and doing that. I said, yeah, but how many hours a week do you spend deliberately talking to people and selling? And it turned out, actually, he did zero. I said, like, well, there's your problem. Stop farting around with all the other stuff and just focusing on selling. He did that for two days and already he'd seen a massive um, increase. So we we focus on a lot of things that we really don't need to be. And I think that is that is you know guilty of the government's, guilty of a lot of things, the trying, um, benefit of the doubt, the trying to make things better, but in doing so, they're actually making things worse. You know, yeah. go, go back to simplicity where it was just yeah. about learning. Yeah. And teaching we the stuff that's hopefully show. gonna mean something. So again, education system because I have, I have big feelings. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I, I know. And, and it's, it's, yeah, I think like a lot of people, it, it's, we, we've got to find a way of basically simplifying things and actually teaching kids um, stuff that in my opinion really matters, you know, yeah. you know, there are no courses out there on relationships. There are no courses out there on sales. There's no courses out there directly on marketing. That's One the three thing things you're going to need that I wish, uh, I, and we might've actually talked about this in a previous episode, but one thing that now having been out in the real world and looking back on my education, if I could have picked anything to have been added to my education, like in high school, I would have loved to have learned how to do my taxes, Yeah. Um, make an investment of any kind, get a loan, <laughs> I mean, like yeah. real life things that you're yeah. going to do are not taught. That's it. And then you're thrown into the world, just expected to figure it out. And those systems are actually, some of them are in place to screw over the applicant yeah. because they don't know everything. And it's like, well, yeah, of course, because you're not teaching us. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, later on, I think this week, we've got a teaching that's coming out for the Going Deeper episode, uh, which is all about is the school, fa or, or are you failing school or is the school failing you? And I think because topics have been taught and have been the steadfast part of curriculum for, you know, generations, that's why they keep, you know, they, they keep being taught. But again, if there is no fundamental practice to them, then what the heck is the point of actually teaching them, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, okay. Anything to add before we move on? <laughs> no, I think I got it all out. Because <laughs> we we got a barn burner of one here. Uh, transgender and uh, the fear that is being taught within schools. Um, okay, so over here in the United Kingdom, um, some facts for you guys. Um, Parents do not want their children to feel confused. And there is an organization who I um, unfortunately wasn't able to get the, the name of, but I, I will aim to get that and put it in the show notes at least. 
Um, but this organization cre uh, creates the curriculum studies and have openly said that their aim is to cut teen pregnancy, stop abusive relationship and stop STDs, which is exactly what Alicia was speaking about earlier on. However, during a, an interview on the TV show in the UK um, this morning, uh, there was a lady and the chief of staff um, who, who was from this organization who was on and basically she was really upset and she was speaking about the fact that her child was exposed to uh, transgender issues. The... I always notice these little bits and pieces, probably because I'm, I'm trained myself to do this. And it was a case of as soon as she started raising issues about transgender, the interview went very one-sided and the people basically just shook their head, you know, repeated that we're here to do, you know, cut trans uh, or cut uh, pregnancy, stop abusive relationships, stop STDs. The lady was spoken over by the host and the interview was closed within 10 seconds. I timed it. So the fact that, you know, when someone mentions that transgender is being taught in schools now for a lot of people, you know, teaching about being gay or being lesbian or being bisexual is bad enough. OK, that's a lot of people's view. When you start talking about transgender issues, um, this is a whole different kettle of fish. Um, mm -hmm. Now, from what I could get and I don't know about Alicia, your uh, results of what you were able to find, I don't believe that this is taught in primary schools. Um, but I do know that parents do not want their children. Um, in fact, scratch that. Actually, it is taught in primary schools. I've got the facts underneath. I do apologize for that. But I know the fact that the, the parents do not want their children being taught this because they don't want them being confused. They don't want to, you know, the children being taught, okay, well, you don't have to be a girl or a boy. You can now be a fridge or you can be a, a one TV show host over here said he was going to be a Penguin Morgan. And uh, this person from the, uh, the trans community actually said, no, you can't be a penguin because a penguin isn't a gender. And he said, and this is a person that was identifying himself as a tree. A tree isn't a gender either. Um, and it's, it's where does this all, you know, where is the end point here? It, it's a case of, you know, if, if someone doesn't feel like a boy or a girl today, they want to be, they want to be a mug. So they want to be this mug here, a nice pink mug. Um, that's got a handle on it and it's like okay whoa we you know and again it's like where does this where does this stop where does this end um we're going to talk a lot about the, the mindset of transgender because that's something obviously as a psychologist in training that i uh, delve into um deeply but i want to know your thoughts about this alicia and see see you know your ideas um so <laughs> <laughs> good stuff I I kind of agree. I, I definitely think that in elementary schools and primary schools, I don't think there's a place mm -hmm. for it. I think that kind of how I mentioned before, I think we need to teach more of an emotional um, intelligence, like yeah. we talked about last week, to, to kids young. And I think it needs to be kind of in the idea of like, this person might be different than you. It's okay. Yeah. Um, I agree that at such a young age, things are very impressionable. Mm -hmm. I mean, we kind of talked about this a few weeks ago too, of like the tomboy and how apparently yeah. that's like a yeah. thing in the UK anymore. Um, but I feel like most kids, most normal kids, every, any, any kid goes through this phase at a young age of trying yeah. to figure out who they are sexually. I think that it's natural. Mm -hmm. I think that you have to, as a parent, kind of let these things just happen. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's when the parents start, and I, and I think you kind of mentioned this in the notes where you talked about it. It's when the parents start giving it the label. It's when the parents start giving it this one side or the other yeah, that the kid the then gets. To. And I think that as a parent, it is the best, the best possible thing you can do if your kid's under the age of like, let's say 12, mm -hmm. um, is to just foster whatever feeling that they're going through at that moment, yep. let them dress however they want, let them play with whatever they want to play with. Don't give them this idea of like, you're a boy, you're a girl, just, just, you know, let's just let them do what they're going to do. And then eventually later down the line, let's give them the education. Let's yeah. talk about what it means. And I agree with you that the, the repercussions 
of some of these things talk are about that. Yeah. talked about. And it's almost like we put this happy little sticker on it, yeah. like, yay. But it's this, it's a huge medical procedure. Yeah. And, and you're right, there's complications that can yeah. happen from it. So at such a young age, kids can't understand that. They don't understand the long-term effects of it. So yeah, I just think at such a young age, let's just foster whatever feeling they're going through. Kids are going to go through these, yeah. these phases of, I went through a phase of literally wearing basketball shorts and big t-shirts and running through the dirt. And you would, I mean, if, if I had had certain guidance, I probably would have thought I was a boy mm -hmm. and, you know, eventually you kind of just work through it. My parents yeah. were very like, just do whatever you have mm -hmm. to do. And eventually, I think kids eventually figure it out for themselves. Yeah. You just have to give them the space to do it. I, I agree. And I think, you know, th there's a lot to unpack there because, you know, again, and, and I completely agree. I have a, a lot of friends of mine that went through the exact same thing. Big shirts, you know, baseball hats and shorts and jeans and, and whatever. And at no point. Yeah, I remember playing with them, you know, as, yeah. as a child, you know, and it was like at no point did we ever sit there and say, oh, do you want to be a boy today? You know, I've, I've heard um, students that I have taught um, that have said, oh, you know, I, I feel more boyish today. Um, now, how this works, folks, from a psychological perspective is specifically when you are going through your teenage years, you, you know, go through different elements of a masculine and a feminine brain. And it's literally all the hormones that are just going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. So sometimes you may feel fully masculine and you may, be, you know, whatever fully masculine means. Other times you may feel more fully feminine. And oftentimes it's when these changes stop. It's, it's almost in some ways like a roll of the dice as to where these, you know, changes stop. Some people feel both things. Um, and that's from a psychological point of view. That is what happens to all of us. And that's what's happening when those changes are going on during the ages, you know, of, of beginning of puberty, whenever, you know, some in some kids cases, it's eight and nine years old, all the way up to 16, 17 years old. I think the thing actually to, to be clear on as well, um, because I know we'll get a comment about it if I don't mention it, it's the difference between gender and sexual. Um, and those two things are, you know, in, in the LGBTQI community are not linked up. Um, some of them may be, um, you know, madly in love with a woman and they may be a guy. And, you know, for them, you know, and I've, I've four friends in particular that I've spoken to about this that said it was really painful for them to be the gender that they were assigned at birth. So they are going through the process of ch changing gender, basically. Um, and, uh, that's that's you know more of the um i i guess you know that how they identify as as themselves you know years ago you dressed like a guy you dressed like a girl now you've got girls dressing like guys and and guys dressing like girls very very different world transsexual obviously is when you take it one step further which is literally to change your sex to change from a man to woman or a woman to um, a man. I do have a question, however, you know, I wonder if you then go from, well, I'm non-binary, and I wonder if it's like from a man to a tree or a woman to a spoon. I don't know how that works. <laughs> that, I haven't given it that okay. great deal of thought. I'll be very honest, and I'm sure I'll get a little bit of backlash for this myself, but <clears throat> I am completely and totally in support of any sexual and gender decision that adults want to make for themselves. I'm not sure how I feel about this, like, I'm a tree. I'm a, like, I just don't, I just feel like as a human, mm -hmm. like, we we have to stay at least within that that human yeah. frame, because from, then from it's- From a philosophical point of view, yeah. Then just, <laughs> then it's just madness and crazy, and it's yeah. like, you can do whatever the, the heck you want. And so it's like, we're not magical. <laughs> like. Well, the thing is, if someone came to you for a job and said, Alicia, my name is Dr. Spoon, and today I, I, I identify as a fork, will you give me a job? The chances are you're going to probably think, um, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is, yeah, there's definitely that, like... But, but that is, you know, that's a reality, um, again, because as, as I'm going to talk about this in, in later on, um, but from a psychological point of view, there is so much more that's going on here. Um, and it is really important. Um, I am all for the view, like Alicia said, look, if, if you guys are you know, an adult 
um, it's one thing. However, when you've got children as young as three years old, I went and I did the stats um, uh, that are being referred, and it's 50 people every single week that are being referred to transgender clinics. Yeah. Okay, and then either given pills or given an operation, Some in some cases before their legal age. Now, for me, um, the way that I look at this is that there is, they've either been exposed to something, they are either being exposed to something, or there's something psychologically that's going on. That, that's the first thing that I would say about that. Um, if you're a child in particular, I, I would say, well, you know, is it, is it a phase? Is it a tomboy thing? Um, you know, what is actually going on here? Um, giving kids hormone replacement at such an early age, it's in my opinion, not, not acceptable at all. Um, in fact, studies have shown that between 80 and 90% of children who go through puberty do become comfortable with their bodies, as Alicia was talking about earlier on. Um, the scary thing is that in 2000 or, or in um, the last uh, reports for this uh, transgender um, referrals, I guess you'd say, it was in 2017, and there'd been a thousand percent increase in transgender referrals, and many who were female that ended up with or already had underlining mental health conditions. Um, so I don't know how you know familiar you guys are and Alicia yourself about the whole transgender process, but. Uh, Jazz Jennings, who is uh, who went through the transgender process, uh, began puberty blockers at age 11, uh, began cross sex hormones at age 13 and had a very painful surgical procedure that had massive complications. Um, now, for me personally, where I'm at right now, I would honestly say that a transgender operation should only be offered after every other possible avenue has been explored. I would, and, and this is part of something again, as part of our decade plan to be able to work with other psychologists that work in this field and that are able to say, what's really going on here? And if a child says, well, I, don't, I just hate being a woman or I hate being a guy, why do you hate being a guy? And uh, someone explored this with me that, you know, they hate being a guy or they hate being a woman because guys seem to have, you know, all the benefits. They can pee standing up. They seem to get, you know, better jobs and they seem to get this and they seem to get that. Um, and, you know, they had latched on to since an early age, you know, guys get it best, guys do it best, guys, you know, you know all of these different things. Um, but to go through an operation like this is brutal. And, um, you know, folks, I, I don't think, you know, a lot of people know actually how brutal this is, but it is, it, it's in the, you know, extremes. If, if you could understand what's going on, it is in the extremes of brutality and you are never, ever the same. And the reports actually show that from ages 19 and upwards, for those that have gone through transgender operations, many now identify as the sex they were before and are actually having the transgender operations undone but the, the bigger thing is psychologically and from a core point of view you know it, it rips you apart and i think it's handed out way too easily i think as well that um when, when you know puberty blockers for example are given at such an early age and then you're growing up and you're an adult and all these things you know, you've got to think as to what is actually, you know, going to happen to you later on in life. And I don't think a lot of people either are thinking about it. I think they're latching onto an idea and a concept. Um, but I certainly would want to look from a psychological point of view. I'd, I'd want to know more information before I just said, right, okay, we've exhausted every opportunity and every other avenue. You know, th this is this is your choice. And uh, But I would not be giving it for teenagers, would be my honest thing. I, I definitely agree. Um, it's, it's funny because, oh, shit, I just lost my train of thought completely. <laughs> oh my God. I hate when that happens. We I wrote down a note and like the thought I had just went out the window. Okay. Hold on. What was the last thing you just said? <laughs> For me, I wouldn't give, uh, transgender operations to teenagers. Okay. That's okay. Good, good, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> back on back on my train um, <laughs> um I cannot understand how and why we would give kids these hormone blockers and these different hormones puberty 
and adolescence and your hormones acting up is crazy enough, yeah. hard enough, difficult enough to understand to throw in all this other stuff. Like I, I just cannot even fathom going through that process. And I mean, I had an, I mean, I think most people have a hard time going through puberty yeah. with more hormones kicking in as it is yeah. to add this extra layer on top is just insanity to me. And you're right. I think, and I, I mentioned this before, we have to not just go right to the, you know, permanent solution. Let's discuss it. Let's yeah. talk about it. Why are you feeling this way? It's, it's going and talking to a professional, which like I mentioned, is very taboo, is very kind of not accepted. A I think lot as of- well, it's making sure you talk to the right professional as yes. well. I think that there needs to be maybe professions that they strictly are just in LGBTQ yeah. conflicts in young children, young adults. Um, I believe that maybe just like a lot of other procedures, this procedure shouldn't be allowed in ages, you know, X and below, you know, maybe what it made is 18, it maybe is 21, but let the kid go through the development stages, let them really try to figure it out. And then when they become an adult, then let them make the decision. Well, you have, you know, drinking laws. I think in the States, it's what, 23, 25 over here. It's 21 over here. um, I believe in certain places it's 18 and 21. Why, you know, if, if you're going to have alcohol ages, why on earth would you not have yeah. an age restriction for something like this, unless it's a severe case? But, you know, I, for me, it comes down to, do you really think that the issues that you're facing as the gender that you are is going to change when you, you know, go through this operation? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have the mind of a transgender. Yeah. And I, I do think it's crazy that we have certain laws that... Mm-hmm protect kids to uh, to certain things until a certain age yet for some reason this huge life altering body altering decision can be made at any point in time which is just insane to me Mm -hmm. um it's funny what you said about how a lot of women want to become men because of the social structure of and i'm gonna throw the word out there of the patriarchy (laughs) and it's 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 funny because anytime I throw that word out there, everyone's like, eh. they, get, they freak out because it's such a hot topic. And I'm, 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 I will, I'm not afraid to bring it up. Yeah. It's a reality. It is present. And I don't care what anybody says. It is still an issue. Oh yeah. Um, I was, I was naive going into the workplace. I thought that um, genders weren't really discriminated against in the workplace I thought we had finally gotten to a place in our society where it wasn't a factor but (laughs) come to find out still very much an issue I think when it comes back to this LGBTQ this transgender issue I think this is a thing where we need to start teaching our kids very very young the benefits of both and stop putting this patriarchal lens on things of like men get this and men get that and there's a lot of downsides. Yeah. There's a lot of upsides to being a woman. And I also think too, there needs to be, and I know there are, there's so many amazing women role models out there, but I think their stories need to be told more. I think they need to come into schools more often and say, Hey, I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. I was able to make it to this point in my life just by sure will. Yeah. I had a lot of road bumps, but guess what? Now I'm a trailblazer. Yeah. I'm making it better for you and you're going to make it better for the the kids that come after you what, what i find interesting just, sorry alicia just, just to, mm-hmm. to you know to to go on that actually from my perspective as a guy here in the uk i actually think it's turning to more of a feminine um society where mm-hmm. guys in some ways because again the whole thing about guys in their position i feel that a lot of guys have lost their position now and they're treated like little boys and you know to, to be able, honestly i mean the amount of people that i've worked with that have been female that are like oh good little boy good little boy it's like sorry do you realize you know <laughs> what's so, going on here <laughs> one thing i want to say to that is i don't i don't agree with, with that i i'm a I, I guess you could put a feminist label on me but 
I, I also believe that there are extremists. And oh, yeah. unfortunately, I feel like when you say feminist, mm -hmm. you are assuming and thinking about the extreme of exactly that. Yes. Of just like, yeah. you know, and I, I don't, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to be literally equal. Like, yeah, like stop. I agree. Literally, because now we're yeah. just now we're doing no better than what men have done right. in the past. And it's funny that you say that though, because I thought that's how America was starting to go. But after like getting out into the world into the um, the workplace a little bit, it's starting to happen. Yeah. But there's still a lot of like top, top, top positions that are still oh, absolutely. by yeah. men. We are working there. <laughs> but absolutely. I do believe that we as women, it, this kind of goes back to history repeating itself. You need to be aware of your past yeah. to not repeat it. Right. We as women cannot do that because then we are just causing yeah. the exact same problem that we were fighting against. Yeah. So that's, I just think we need to, we need to update the education around it. it. Like you say, it comes back to communication. The interesting thing is, and I actually write about this in my book, that I, I firmly believe at one period in time that we were all one. We traveled together, um, you know, in, in a small community, and it was literally a case of one decided, or one half of the community decided to go north, one decided to go west, and that's where the split was. And then more splits happened, and more splits happened, and then couple of thousand years passed and basically we decided oh we're going to go to war with that person we're going to invade that country we're going to do this we're going to do that and we all forgot that actually at one point we were equal you know yeah. in in terms of a of, of, of person and, and there was no you know we, we used our strengths we used our things um but we're getting way off topic there um <laughs> interesting thing alicia actually i'm interested to know if you know Mm -hmm. um, the side effects that these um, hormone replacements and what was the phrase? I want to get the exact phrase. The uh, cross sex hormones, the effects that they can actually have on on the person that's taking them. I don't know specifically, but I can imagine like maybe not hormones, but I I'll be honest, I take and anxiety med mm -hmm. just to, and it's very low dose, but it's just to balance me. But you're not going to turn into a tree or anything, are you? No. <laughs> no. So like, but I know how crazy yeah. my, my mind can get if I go one day without them. Yeah. So I, I can't even imagine the kind of crazy things that happen chemically uh -huh. in your brain because of these things? Well, it's actually not so much, well, in fact, yes, yes. Uh, so here you have impaired cognif cognitive ability. So it's the ability to be able to think clearly. Um, you can also get sterile. So basically, the, if, if you know, if you're a guy, your sperm doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. If you're a woman, other bits and pieces don't work. And you can also wow. develop higher risk of cancer as well as a result of these medications. This has not been taught. I had to dig severely um, for this information in order to get it. Um, there's a lot more here. And I think, again, a lot of people, and again, the irreversible mental damage that has been done to a person and to their bodies is, uh, is, is humongous. So um, again, I think there needs to be a lot more transparency for sure. The, the cancer part of it, that is crazy because, yeah. I mean, we already have, mm -hmm. a, I would say, epidemic of... Yeah of cancer. I mean, mm -hmm. we, it's already so bad and we already don't have enough treatments yeah. to deal with them. Like, why are we throwing yeah. extra, extra ways to get cancer? I mean, the, the crazy cancer. thing is that a lot of these things that we, you know, take from a medical point of view, they actually occur naturally in our body. You know, uh, CBD, believe it or not, occurs naturally in our body. Um, some form of, I guess you'd say, crack cocaine and speed and LSD, it all occurs naturally in our body. Uh, paracetamol, uh, you know, all of the other things that are there. Um, if you're suffering with depression, oftentimes you'd be given a medication to increase your serotonin level, which makes you feel all blissed out and everything. If you're overproducing serotonin, you get a medication to, you know, to slow it down, but we're producing it. Um, but when you have it in excess, then I know what it did to me when I was on prednisone um, for, for colitis and how insane and loopy that made me that I still sometimes have effects with to this day. Um, you know, and, and to welcome that into your body, you know, it, it tells me 
for from a person that is transgender and i've I, i've gone through the journey with one person i know what um they went through from what they told me and they said you know it was so painful for them to be a woman um that they couldn't think of anything other than being a guy and they walked me through the process of what it was like basically getting this metal penis and that would be a there would be a button when you want to have intercourse and everything and you know but it is brutal it is painful and that said to me more than anything it's like what is going on in you as a person and in your mind um that you would want to have that i mean that that spells a lot to me there's a lot of things that are going on um and i would be interested obviously uh, you know in, in more um more results and, and more um statistics to be able to you know to, to know that a little bit more for sure um it's crazy that you mentioned like the actual like how yeah how they make it happen yeah i think I think for people that don't do the research, the people that don't know about it, they just kind of assume it's yeah. a very natural, mm -hmm. normal addition. No. <laughs> and the technology and science isn't there. And yeah, no. you're going to have, these are the options. And I don't think it's taught no. enough of exactly what does it mean. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's possibly easier to go from being a guy to a girl or a man to a woman, um, because basically you're taking away, you're having an absence of wedding tackle, um, you know, whereas it's going the opposite way. There's a lot of brutality. And again, I won't get into it because <laughs> the, yeah. the specifics, like I say, are the, the brutal. I mean, it's something yeah. that you would have done in the Victorian era. Um, yeah. You know, it's and, and plus you're going to go off in every metal detector around the world. So yeah. Yeah. you're like, it's just. Uh... Yeah. I mean, what do you say about that? You know, you're getting patted down. It's like, oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. um, it's funny that you say that, though, because uh, this definitely will be looked at as some archaic torture yeah. type yeah. of solution. Like we looked at like how we look at, um, you know, the, old medieval br medical. Yeah. Practice. Brain surgery in the Victorian era. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it's gonna happen. Oh, yeah. And it's it's just a matter of time and our but, technology. <laughs> but going back to what we said last week, I think that's why, you know, the doctors are so probably excited about this. They have to be because all of a sudden it's new science, you know, from, from their point of view, it's like, oh great, we get to work on living subjects and yeah. we get to advance this science. Um, you know, it, it's yeah, same as Victorian England. Yeah. Which I guess for for some people in a certain situation a certain age bracket i think that if that's their choice then that's their choice but kind of boiling it back down to this whole topic it's before a certain age it's right. it is just no i i just can't understand why because yeah. it's such a permanent thing in a time when nothing in your brain mm -hmm. is permanent i yeah. mean I, I went through 10 million different phases absolutely from 12 to 18. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a completely different person five times over. Yeah. I mean, you your know? brain and, and your, new, your, your neurons inside your head are just firing off, you know, a million times every single second and all at once, which is why, you know, you're so confused about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I would, you know, again, I would put it on the parents. I'd say, guys, look, why on earth are you allowing this to happen at such a young age, you know? And, and again, I'd be interested in the feedback as to what, you know, parents would have to say about that. Um, you know, I, and I know from some in the past had said, well, it's my child's decision. And it's like, well, how many five-year-olds? Yeah. Because you know, this is a topic that came up the other day when someone was shouting a ball and crying blue murder. How many five-year-olds really know their brain? And if you look psychologically on how the brain changes from five years old to 19 years old, I can say this because I've done it. It's incredible. Um, it's yeah. that's, you, you should see this from an artistic perspective on the scanner. It, it comes in all these multiple colors, okay? Blues, yellows, greens, oranges, all of this stuff. By the time we reach 18, 19 years old, it's just blue. It's like ocean blue. Um, when our brains have actually settled down and it's not going through all of these a million and one changes. It's incredible. That's really, <laughs> I, I, this is kind of a side change. I love art and science mixed together yeah. i think that is like the most beautiful thing Ooh. in the whole world anyways <laughs> well i saw cells the other day that was uh it looked like snowflakes and trees when you actually get close up to a cell it's just gorgeous but yeah. we, we, we digress <laughs> folks we're, we're nearly there we've nearly covered so much that, that we want to cover we may need to break this up into two parts um and that's okay but 
one of the things that, that really struck me as, as we're so, you know, sort of concluding here um, is about the importance of protection. Because I know there's a lot of folks that will still say, I don't think it should be taught in schools. I want to ask you a question, you know, if you're a boy who identifies as a homosexual or you're a girl identifying as a lesbian, um, now, if you're doing that at five years old, you know, again, I don't know. I have not been that way. <laughs> so I cannot, you know, say that. Um, but my initial thought is, would they really know, you know, what it meant? I mean, we start developing attractions for sure, but they come actually, again, psychologically, later on in life so maybe when you're beginning puberty the way that it works if, you, if you're a guy in particular believe it or not as weird as this sounds if you're a young boy at three years old you have the hots for your mother and if you're a girl you probably have the hots for your father and what happens is there's an obstacle um you know you, you're you know because all you're all you're exposed to is your mother and basically, it is as weird and warped as this is, but it is psychologically proven. Um, the boy fancies his mother and, you know, he's like, oh, great, I'm going to be, I'm going to marry mummy, which is a really messed up thing. <laughs> but uh, what actually happens then? So go on, Alicia. Well, I was just going to say, because there is a, there is an ideology that you eventually marry yes. <laughs> your mother or father. And I will tell you that for me and my brother, uh -huh. our partners are are very very similar to our mother and father so we, we have that a little bit with, with katie and I, I remind her more of her dad probably than she does of my mom which is probably a good thing yeah. um <laughs> but, but both had red hair they both had yeah. red hair so that's interesting um deeply seated psychological stuff sometimes absolutely but what happens there is is dad comes along again you know depending on your family dynamic i'm speaking obviously if it's if it's a male and a female i know there's a lot of different things that are there um, and I want, I want to let you guys know that I understand that. Um, but what often happens then is, you know, uh, boy fancies mom, dad is there. So dad is, you know, the blocker because, you know, you can't kill your dad. Um, even at like three and four years old, you can attempt it, but it's probably not going to happen. Um, and then those feelings get suppressed until puberty begins. And then you start having those feelings, hopefully in a more um, civil and normal manner. Um, and for anybody listening to the uh, audio version there, I did air quotes for a normal <laughs> manner because otherwise you won't be able to see it. Um, yeah. But it's really interesting that, you know, a five-year-old a five -year -old child, you know, would they really know um, that they are gay? Would they know that they are, you know, lesbian or, or, or whatever it might be? Um, but hypothetically speaking, if they did, I do feel that it's really important for them to be protected. Like we said earlier on, if they're coming from parents that say, oh, it's just a phase, you know, if, the, if they're older mm -hmm. and maybe in secondary school and their parents have said, no, we're, we're just disbanding, you know, we don't want to know anything about this. Um, as I've experienced from youth work, it is really, really important that they have somewhere to be able to go where it's safe and to talk about it and to discuss it. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes at five years old, I think we're, we're far too quick, as Alicia was saying earlier on, to jump on things and give it all meaning. Oh, the, the, they're running around like a boy today, if they're a girl, and uh, oh, all of a sudden they want to be transgender, you know. Um, but I think it is really important to um, have a form of protection. And I understand now, looking at it, why the Board of Governors treated that minister Maybe not, certainly not to the extremes that it should have been, but, uh, or so to the extremes that they did, but I, I do understand why there was that concern there, because, you know, they want to protect the children that are transgender, uh, that are uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, you know, their, their sexuality, what, whatever it might be. Um, what are your thoughts on this? So, I do agree that at five you might not know or understand what exactly gay and lesbian is. Um, I, I believe that from, from my experience, from stories I've heard from friends, I really do think that most kids go through some phase at some point of wanting to be like the other sex mm -hmm. purely out of an curiosity. Yeah. And I think that's in a very important part of, a child's mm -hmm. development. I feel like people and parents that squash, like mostly for guys, I feel like if a boy, if a young boy all of a sudden wants to wear dresses and yeah. play with Barbies and immediately the parents are panicked 
and they're like, oh my God, my child's gay. And it's like, no, (laughs) it's like your child is exploring life. And once you put that label on it is when they start recognizing it as such. And that's where the, the skewed miss of it all yeah. can happen. I do I do think that there needs to be protection, especially given the insidiousness of our culture. Mm-hmm. You know, especially if you know your child goes to school and announces it and then all the kids are just mean. You know, yeah. there's certain things you have to do <clears throat> to protect them. But yeah, I just I think we have to and I think the other thing too is a lot of times when young kids are fostering these relationships, whatever the relationship yeah. is with other kids, I feel like so much of the time we're, and you know, I'm, I, I'm guilty of this. I'm sure most people are guilty of this. You go, oh, look, it's your boyfriend, you know, to a little girl. Oh, look, it's your girlfriend. Yeah. You know, it's like, we need to stop mm-hmm. doing that because I feel like a lot of times you don't let boy and yeah. young boys and girls just be friends because you're constantly putting this sexual overtone mm-hmm. it. and it's like kids aren't even looking at it that way yeah they don't look at their friend who just happens to be a girl as a girlfriend mm-hmm. they're just like that's my friend and she just happens yeah. to be a girl um and I also think that there is this sometimes this issue and of like you know if kids don't have friends Um, they then start looking for, you know, emotional um, relationship connections. And they can sometimes displace a friendship with somebody as a romantic relationship because of how they were taught, Mm -hmm. how they were inundated with certain things. And then that can mess them up because if one friend feels a certain way and the other friend feels a different way, you know, I just think we need to take, take the sexuality out of it completely and just let kids be kids Mm -hmm. of just like you know explore what you need to talk to them when they are getting confused and they bring up stuff Mm -hmm. and then back to the counseling and coaching I just think there needs to be more of it at a young age and take the taboo off of it I I think you know a, a lot of stuff that we've covered you know actually the parents seem to create more of the issues uh, for, as, as we're going through here, it's oftentimes, you know, the, the older generation's prejudice um, of doing this and the way that they were raised. And that's yeah. what they're putting on. Something that I wrote down, actually, as a note for, for um, something that you'd said, actually, about labels. Labels uh, create judgments. Mm-hmm. And that's why I will say to folks, you know, I may know, you know, what, what gender you are and what sexuality preference that you have. You don't need to tell me. And yeah. I've had people before that have said that. And I said, why is it important for me to know your gender? And they said, well, because I'm proud. And it's like, well, can you not be proud? And, you know, why, why do I feel, why, why do you feel from a psychological point of view, this is what I do when I'm coaching. Um, but why do you feel the need to tell me this? And then they start thinking about it. I said, you know, the, the whole thing about labels create judgments. And, you know, people will judge you. Um, based on what they know of you. If they know me as John Morris, the artist and psychologist, and they know all the good things about me, they're going to respond in a great way. But for example, if, you know, I don't know, hypothetically speaking, John Morris is a a cross-dressing transgender tree, try and say that three times really quickly, (laughs) um, you know, they are going to respond to me like, what the heck are you doing? Um, You know, people will respond to the odd things that they see. I know a couple of years ago, we did an experiment with a a YouTube show, basically where my character um, was silent and I had face paint on and I was teaching people how to paint. And we did it for Halloween, which it worked for. We did several episodes afterwards. Some people got a kick out of it. Other people were like, this is odd. This is weird. People will respond, you know, in, 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 in bizarre ways. Um, so that's, that's the other thing, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for, and, and actually furthering on from what Alicia was saying, it's not actually just children actually anymore that are saying, you know, oh, well, I, I've, I've reached an age of my life and I want to be gay or I've reached an age of my life and I want to be lesbian or bisexual. Or whatever. You've got adults that are doing this all the time. I have a friend of mine actually that's just recently 
found out and, you know, mother of many children and found out that she is bisexual and, you know, is, is off exploring all of that. Now, that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother time, um, because I think, you know, when you've got responsibilities, it's where does the insanity stop? <laughs> um, you know, but I, I think it's important, again, you know, for children that are identifying that and, and going through that phase, you know, children don't have those prejudices. Prejudices are... Um, they learn and they're often learned from parents and they will, you know, parents oftentimes, certainly in my generation, I sound like an old man, um, mm -hmm. but they would say, you know, oh, don't hang out with so-and-so. Don't hang out with that little gay boy. Don't hang out with her. She's a lesbian. You know, don't hang out with her. He, he's odd or she's odd. And one thing that I've discovered since going through my own, you know, spiritual transformations and, and it's affected everything else is just be, just be, don't be, you know, putting all these prejudices and all these negative things and, and all this low energy crap that's on people. Um, just, just be, and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I just, I, I hope in some ways now, as I say, after studying this and looking at this from so many different angles that, you know, that this stuff actually brings the, the generation that's there now in, in schools, if anything, I hope it just brings love and tolerance and peace together. I really yeah. do, um, because that's something we're, we're needing so much more. I think, you know, if, if I'm honest and, and bold enough, I think religions will be uh, less practiced uh, as they are now in terms of the traditional ways. Um, mm -hmm. A hundred years from now, I think it'll be very, very, very different. I think it has to be. Um, and um, yeah, sorry, Alicia, go ahead. I, I just wanted to <clears throat> make a point with religion um, that then this is something that I feel like most most people have a very hard time accepting is you can be spiritual yeah. without being religious yeah. and just because you're not a practicing religious mm -hmm. person doesn't mean that you can't be spiritual and have a connection with whoever it is that you pray to talk to believe in whatever um i definitely find myself falling in the spiritual category because i mean i was raised catholic i believe there is something out there that is bigger than us um, and, you know, I have conversations with whoever it is and, but I, I just, there's, when I look at it, especially as a historian, I look at religion and the church as like a man-made thing that isn't really reflecting, this is a completely different topic, but <laughs> that we'll there's, talk about that I at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But I just think there needs to be a little bit more understanding. And that, like you said, I'm sure in the next hundred years, we're probably going to end up in a more spiritual yeah. place than a religious place. And I think that we need to start accepting that as being okay. And that might actually start allowing people to accept other religions, spirituality for whatever they are. Mm -hmm. If we if we keep going in this trend, that's the hope. Well, well, definitely. And I think, you know, when people see, because this is one of the things that I'd found um, all the way through, whether it was my ministry practice when I identified as a Christian, um, you know, and, and now I don't identify as a Christian, um, but I identify, you know, as, as you know, um, being in relationship with God and, and you know, my own spirit and, and the divine spirit um, for sure. Um, I don't identify with Christian because I saw how so many Christians treated people and certainly within the church and people saying, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And I'm like, if you're a Christian, I don't want to be. And the other thing is, again, labels create judgment. If, if I don't have a label on me, you know, you can't then come back and say, oh, well, you know, well, well you're this. And do you realize Jesus did this? And it's like, actually, Jesus didn't do this. <laughs> just just for, for telling people, you know, all these different things. I, I, I mean, I know it's another topic, but I, I laugh sometimes when people come up to me and say, do you realize Jesus did this? And I'm like, where, when, how, when, why? <laughs> um, 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 it's like, exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and, it, and it was also negative and all these different things. Um, and uh, I, I had a great conversation the other day, actually, with a, a young gentleman. And he said, uh, you know, you, you probably more, uh, he's trying to put a label on me. He says, you, you identify as a spiritual mystic, don't you? And I said, let me get a dictionary. I said, I don't particularly know yet. And, uh, and I said, no, I don't. I, I just don't. I, I don't identify with any label. Um, but he said, uh, how do you know that God exists? He says, you, you, you've studied philosophy for all these years. How do you know God exists? And I said, simple. And uh, I got very, very quiet and, and uh, it, it, was, it was actually really wonderful. And he's, he's leaning in, similar to what you're doing now. 
And uh, he said, well, go on, how do you know God exists? I said, well, do you believe in love? And he said, uh, well, yeah, of course. I said, okay, how do you know that love exists? He says, because I can see it. I can, you know, I can be it and everything else. So I sent him to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I said, replace the, the word love with the word God. And it's the whole, para, uh, the whole passage of love is kind, love is, uh, you know, um, doesn't keep record of wrongs and patient. And so replace that with God. And he said, that's how I know God exists. And plus, I just look around. Um, yeah. So, you know, I know it was way off topic, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an important segue sometimes. Definitely. But, but I think for me, where, where I kind of, you know, um, fall on all of these things, just, just as we wrap up for, for a conclusion, you know, there definitely needs to be more communication. Uh, I think there needs to be more transparency and people need to know what's being taught. That's the first thing. Um, parents need to accept the responsibilities and learn how to communicate with their children about sexuality. And I think it's important if you don't want someone else teaching your kids about it, I think it's important for you to do this. But there is, you know, a couple of important things that I, I do feel that people need to know. And it's, you know, one of them is this. Sexuality was placed in our bodies for the sole purpose of procreation. And God the divine spirit, nature, whatever you want to call it, added pleasure to it. Otherwise, let's face it, no one would go for it. Um, you know, it, it basically, you know, if, if, if sex didn't have pleasure to it, well, what the heck's the point in doing it? Yeah. Uh, you know, because let's face it, I, I, I feel for women, maybe this is one of the reasons women turn to guys because they don't have babies. I can understand. <laughs> yeah, it, it's brutally painful and it's not fun. <laughs> That's actually another topic that we can have an entire different episode on. I'm intrigued. <laughs> normalizing women not wanting to have children that's a good one i have got um one friend of mine in particular who i'm, I'm straight away thinking of um yes that, friends, that would be a good one i have friends who are like yeah i'm just not gonna have kids i they they have various reasons mm -hmm. and unfortunately a lot of times people look at them like they have three heads and it's like yeah. So what? I, I know for That's us, for, from certain folks in, in certain churches, again, I won't mention any names, um, but they, you know, looked at us as if we had three heads when we didn't have children already. And it's like, well, you don't know the surrounding things. Again, it goes back to not knowing what's going on, not seeing the other side of the Rubik's Cube, um, you know, and, and making those judgments. And judgments never reveal who we are. They reveal who they are, who the person mm -hmm. is. Um, you know, but the, the whole thing is, if our life is ruled by our hormones, as this is happening around the world, then we've got a very distorted view and perception of life. And if all that we're seeing is sex, 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 you know, um, in schools, and this is what we're being um, exposed to, um, because I, I was thinking about something the other day, actually, I, one of those very profound thoughts when I'd finished brushing my teeth. And um, again, very, very controversial, but people to think about this, you know, people say, you know, uh, porn addicts and, and pedophiles, they're just terrible and they're disgusting human beings. I said, okay, so, so it stops and starts then with the pedophile and the, the porn addict, does it? And some people would say yes. And I said, well, what about Google for allowing it or Yahoo for allowing it to be there? What about the person that uploaded it? What about the person that made the pornography? What about all these other people? What about the filmmakers that are there? What people actually don't understand because they probably haven't thought about it is the, the way of our world right now being a very sexual um, culture, very sexual global culture um, is a reflection of you know, people's in a state of mind. And it always is. That's, that's the result of all that's going on is because people have thought about it. Um, you know, nowadays, it's more socially acceptable to be exploring your sexuality. You know, 50 years, 100 years ago, it would never even been thought of, never even discussed publicly. Um, you know, it's the same thing. If, if drugs were legalized and encouraged, um, you know, again, CBD is being encouraged a lot more and has got a lot more uh, exposure. People are trying it. Um, if, if crack cocaine was legal, I guarantee you a lot of people would try it. You know, if, if sucking an exhaust was legal, well, it probably is legal, but it's definitely not advisory. Probably more people would try it. You know, it, it's, it's ultimately... Um, you know, we're given this body and it's intelligent. The only problem is, like I say, we didn't read the user manual on how to use it. And the problem for many people is they, they're going and trying to make all these changes around the world and they have no idea <laughs> what they're doing. And as I said to someone the other day that was saying, well, I'm a counselor and I know everything, I paraphrase, but that's basically it. 
I said, no, you know nothing. And I said, you just <laughs> let the rest of us, we know nothing. We think we know things. We think we have the answer. We've got one possible conclusion. But yeah. what I would conclude with is if I was a, a little, I don't even know how to say this because I sound Irish when I say, if I was a little gay boy or a little <laughs> gay girl, you know, I would probably want that support there that wasn't there, you know, when I was a child. I'd want my friends to be understanding. I'd want that support because when you've got the support, it means that you don't have to go by it alone. And when you don't have to hide who you really are and you don't have to go it alone, it means suicide rates drop because you feel more supported and accepted. And it, for people that are, you know, practicing of religion, just keep asking yourself, you know, what, what would your divine creator, your divine spirit, Jesus, Muhammad, w whatever you call it, you know, what, what would their version of love be? And, you know, how would their response be to it? Um, but I know I would definitely want that support for sure. So that's, that's Absolutely. my thoughts. Absolutely. I agree. Um, I, we talked about it a little bit <clears throat> in a couple episodes before, but support systems can make or break how you develop. Yeah. I mean, I had a really good support system and a lot of the issues that I think that I could have had, had I not had them, were, or were uh, nipped in the butt early yeah. or learned how to manage and cope. So yeah, I, I agree. A support system is number one, absolutely the most important thing for, for anybody, for any issue. I completely agree. And it is, and I know, you know, there's a lot of folks out that say, you know, what about my um, beliefs and what about this and what about that? You know, I, and again, I think the, like we said, right at the beginning of the show, folks, um, you know, we're not going to have all the answers for you. It's not designed to have all the answers, but it's designed to get you to think. And if you're, uh, and this will be very controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. If your beliefs and your support system take away from love and take away from actually caring about somebody else and what they're going through, then you need to evaluate your support system. Again, from a Christian perspective, from a um, many Catholic perspective, you know, if, if Jesus, you know, turned around and said, well, I'm the son of God, you know, so I'm not going to help a homosexual. I'm not going to help a you know, uh, a lesbian, I'm not going to help a transgender, then equally wouldn't help the al alcoholic or the drug addict or the person going through divorce or the person, you know, and, and I find it so sad. And I've seen churches do this where somebody gets divorced and one member of that party is basically shunned and kicked out of the church. Um, I've seen people excommunicated, personally excommunicated from Baptist churches um, because of a decision that they made that didn't line up with their theologies, which is part of the reason I, I really, I don't struggle with it because I choose not to, but I just don't have an issue now in, in being part of a church. I'm just like, it, to me, it's, it's not a, a thing. Um, but I think that's, you know, I think people need to explore that and they need to say, well, but, but the Bible says this, and it's like, no, the letters of Paul say this. And if you actually study who Paul was, his mindset, and uh, the, the, the fact of where Paul was coming from, the time of where Paul was written um, in all of his different letters, then you will have a clearer understanding as to why he said what he did. If it was today, I think it would you know, quite possibly be very, very different. Um, that's, that's my thoughts. So have you anything that you want to say before we wrap up for today? Yeah, um, I... What you said, I think, is very powerful, and it's all emotional really, now. Yeah, I think it's a very hard pill for a lot of yeah. people to swallow. But when you really look at the world, yeah. you, love is really the thing that's going to help save us all. I mean, that's I think the foundation of literally everything. Our, our relationship, it's the foundation of God. If it isn't, then there's no point. Um, and, and I just want to add, actually, just, just you know, f uh, before um, I forget mainly, um, the reason that I can say this is because, believe it or not, at one period in time, I had that mindset of, oh, my goodness, you know, gays are terrible, um, because I was raised that way. I, I had that mindset of, oh, my goodness, I can't believe so-and-so is bisexual. I can't believe so-and-so is transgender. And I thank God that I have been freed from a lot of that institutionalized legalistic stuff that... I'll be honest, folks, as, as someone who was a practicing Catholic and someone who, who was a practicing Christian, you know, I, I felt 
actually so limited by it because God was just in a box in mm-hmm. this one place. And now, I mean, heck, we connect with everything and, and it, yeah. it's, it's incredible. And I encourage people to, you know, to, to explore. And some might say, well, John, you know, you're no longer a friend to God. Well, that's not your decision to make. Yeah. You know, theologically, I can't unfriend God. It's not like on Facebook. Just saying. <laughs> Sorry, anyway, Alicia, you, you continue. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I think the only other thing that I do want to add is just um, a resource that I know about. So one of the, my favorite podcasts out there, um, I've talked to John off air about this before. Um, I love the show Buffer, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And there's a podcast called Buffering the Vampire Slayer. And the two hosts are um, two gay women. They were married and now they're not, which I think at, at any level, just the fact that they can still yeah. coexist and do this show on a very friendly and they, they're both are like, we're much better off as friends. I think that first of all is a huge lesson and a huge, um, just hearing it like through the episodes, I think is, is just amazing. And actually it's funny. They have a, they have a song that said, you can always get divorced. <laughs> it's a whole ingrained in the an episode, but one of the hosts, um, before she did the podcast, she was an LGBTQ advocate and still is. And one of the books that she's written is called, this is a book for parents of gay kids. And is literally a guide on how, how to handle the situation appropriately. And cause I think a lot of parents, a lot of times they just don't know how to handle the situation and they handle it poorly. And then they lose a connection with their child. Um, Kristen, and so it's Kristen Nolene. Uh, her website is K R I S T I N N O E L I N E dot com. Um, she does outreach programs. She goes to workplaces and schools to teach about this. So we kind of talked about it a little bit in the episode that sometimes you need a professional to come and mediate it and to come educate it. Cause especially in schools, I think that. I don't think it's their place to come up with the the education. I don't think that they're in the proper position. So I think that it is better to bring in an outside resource, a professional to educate people. So she does that kind of stuff. But if you are a parent of somebody who, of a kid that you think is gay, has come out, you're, you know, you're not sure how to handle and approach it. I would definitely highly encourage um, her book because just having any resource and, and her, her book might lead you down a path to more books and more resources. This is just the one that I know about. Um, and I just felt the need to share it because we've talked about, you know, parents just sometimes don't know. And there's nothing wrong with that either. That's, I just want to put that out there because I feel like so much of the time, and I mentioned this before, parents feel like they need to know everything and it's okay not to. And that's why there's people like Kristen and there's people like us who are here to help educate, learn, direct, do it, do whatever it is that you need to help guide you through it and to kind of just go forward with love like we talked about. Absolutely. And we'll put the, the uh, affiliate link in the chat box below. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon um, and uh, you can check it out. But absolutely, you know, guys, if, if you've got questions, you know, and again, you know, a lot of people do, don't be afraid to type them. You can type them anonymously. You can email us. There's lots of ways to get in touch. You know, we thankfully are building a hub network where literally we're able to spider web out into hundreds of different organizations. Um, and if we can't help you, we'll certainly be able to point you in the direction to be able to 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 get help because you know the the hardest thing is when you've got to suffer alone and especially as well if you're a parent and you've got to suffer alone um that can be really really difficult and uh, you know we, we don't want you to be afraid of you know opening up yes it's important to up your game and you know be comfortable learn how to be comfortable in in talking about these things create a study for yourself on mm-hmm. how to be comfortable um you know you know my philosophy which is if you're lacking in a certain area find books on it there's tons of stuff you can get them free on audiobooks and, uh, and on youtube there's lots of good advice and information out there um but you don't need to struggle that's the main thing um so that's well we hope part. certainly for you know for all you guys that it's been very very beneficial alicia have you anything that you want to say just before we wrap up the show today i think that's it just use use the resources that are out there I, there are so many 
it's insane the resources that we have now compared to even just 10 years ago. Definitely, definitely. And folks, we hope that really helps you um, in, in all the things that are going on right now. And again, if you've got any questions, you can get in touch with us. You can chat, or the, click in the chat bar below. You can get in touch with us on Facebook at Mind, Body and Soul. You can get in touch with us at battleswheelface.com. Um, and there is so, you know, basically you type in, you know, you'll find us somewhere and we'll, we are here to help for sure. Um, and as always, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. We'll put up the link to the book um, in the affiliates link in or the chat section below. And uh, definitely check it out for sure, because I think if you've got those questions, it's going to help. And like Alicia said, it may start you on your own journey of understanding. And if you can understand something a little bit clearer, it means that you're actually giving yourself power and you're taking away the fear. And that's the best thing I think that you can do. So as always, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. She has been the awesome Alicia Madonna. I have been your host, John Morris as well. And uh, until next time, take care, God bless. And we will see you same place, same time next Wednesday. Take care. Bye guys.